Imagine this. You take a modern human, one from 200,000 years ago. Give them a haircut, a hoodie, a pair of sneakers. Drop them into a busy street today, and no one would look twice. Biologically, they were us. Same bodies, same brains, same vocal cords. If you scanned their skull, the differences would be microscopic. But here's the mystery. They didn't act like us. For nearly 150,000 years, nothing happened. No cave art, no musical instruments, no burials with meaning, no jewelry, no symbols, no stories carved in stone, just survival. People hunted, gathered, made stone tools. They lived, but they didn't create. And then, around 50,000 years ago, everything changes. Suddenly, we find art splashed across cave walls. Carvings, beads, ceremonial burials, complex hunting plans, even boats reaching islands beyond the horizon. It's as if something ignited. In a blink of geological time, humans went from living to dreaming, from reacting to their world to reshaping it. So what happened? Why the silence? Why the sudden spark? Did we evolve a new gene? Did language unlock everything? Or have we misunderstood the entire timeline of our species? This is the story of a prehistoric time hole, a gap in the record that shouldn't exist. And how the real answer isn't just about the past, it's about what we still are becoming. For a long time, scientists thought they had a clean explanation, a single mutation, one tiny change in our DNA that rewired the brain, sparked language, and flipped the lights on for modern humanity. The star of the theory? A gene called FOXP2. First discovered in the 1990s, FOXP2 was linked to language and speech. Families with rare mutations in the gene often showed profound difficulties forming words and sentences. When researchers dug deeper, they found FOXP2 regulates dozens of other genes related to brain development, particularly those tied to vocal learning, motor control, and possibly symbolic communication. Suddenly, FOXP2 became the so-called language gene the key to everything. It fit the story. 50,000 years ago, a mutation kicks in, and humans begin to speak, plan, sing, paint, bury their dead. But in 2007, that theory collapsed. Researchers sequenced the Fox P2 gene from Neanderthal DNA and discovered they had the exact same version we do. The same gene, same code, which meant the mutation couldn't be unique to Homo sapiens. If Neanderthals had Fox P2 and weren't painting cave walls in every corner of Europe, then this gene wasn't the full story. FOXP2 might still be crucial for speech, but it didn't explain why a burst of symbolic culture appeared so suddenly. So, if it wasn't a mutation, if there wasn't some spark gene that flipped the switch, then what was it? Maybe the answer isn't in our genes at all. Maybe it's in the dirt. Because while scientists were hunting for mutations in labs, archaeologists were digging up something older, something deeper, something that shattered the timeline. While geneticists were chasing miracle genes in the lab, archaeologists were finding evidence that didn't match the story. The supposed creative explosion 50,000 years ago. Turns out it wasn't an explosion at all. It was a tipping point the peak of a wave that had been building for tens of thousands of years. The best clues were buried in southern Africa. At Blombos Cave, near the coast of South Africa, researchers discovered something astonishing. Pieces of red ochre, etched with crosshatch patterns, dating back 100,000 years. These weren't just scratches, they were symbols. Near those, shell beads, carefully drilled and strung, possibly as jewelry, status markers, or ritual items. That's not survival. That's culture. And it didn't stop there. At Pinnacle Point, just a bit farther up the coast, people were using fire to heat treat stones, improving how they flaked into tools. That's advanced planning and environmental mastery. Some of those layers date back 164,000 years. Suddenly, the 50,000-year revolution wasn't looking like a revolution at all. It was more like a reveal, 
the point where culture reached a scale too big to miss. More clues followed. At Sibidu Cave, signs of early bedding, ochre use, and glue for composite tools. At Deep Kloof Rock Shelter, painted ostrich eggshells used as water flasks. People weren't just surviving, they were designing, decorating, and thinking ahead. It turns out modern behavior didn't start 50,000 years ago. It had been simmering in the background for much longer. So why did we miss it? Simple. Most of the early archaeological work was done in Europe. And Homo sapiens didn't arrive in Europe until about 50,000 years ago. So, of course, that's where the first cave art was found. Of course, that's where the revolution seemed to begin. But that's not when it started. It's just when it got to Europe. For decades, we imagined ourselves as the main characters. The thinkers, the toolmakers, the artists, the only humans capable of imagining gods or painting dreams on stone. But we weren't alone. Homo sapiens shared the world with at least half a dozen other human species. And the more we learn about them, the more our special status starts to blur. For a long time, Neanderthals were cast as hunched, grunting cave dwellers, strong but dumb. That image? Total fiction. Neanderthals had brains as big as ours, sometimes bigger. They made complex Mysterian tools tailored to specific uses and environments. They used fire and may have even used manganese dioxide as a chemical fire starter. That's not instinct, that's chemistry. At Shanidar Cave in Iraq, Neanderthals buried their dead with care. Some graves were lined with pollen and flowers, a potential sign of mourning, ritual, or at the very least, emotion. In Spain, at La Pasiega, Neanderthals painted cave walls with red pigment 64,000 years ago, long before Homo sapiens arrived. And at Brunichel Cave in France, they arranged broken stalagmites into ring structures deep inside a pitch-black chamber. That construction is 176,000 years old. Think about that. A symbolic structure in total darkness, built 100,000 years before the supposed human awakening. In 2010, scientists sequenced DNA from a pinky bone found in Denisova Cave, Siberia. It didn't match Neanderthals, or us. It was something else, a new branch of the human family, the Denisovans. And they weren't just hiding in caves. In that same cave layer, archaeologists found a bracelet, drilled, polished, shaped from green chlorite stone, dated to at least 40,000 years ago, possibly the oldest fine jewelry ever found, and not made by Homo sapiens. That's precision craftsmanship, made with tools, made with intention, made by a mind that could imagine something beautiful. We weren't the only ones who buried our dead, or painted in darkness, or carved meaning into matter. We weren't the first to be human. We were just the ones who lasted long enough to tell the story. So, if Neanderthals could paint, if Homo sapiens were carving symbols 100,000 years ago, then why did it take so long for culture to take off? Why the silence? The answer might not lie in DNA, but in math. For a culture to survive, it needs more than brilliance. It needs people. Enough people to share ideas, to remember them, and pass them on. Picture a tribe of 30. A hunter invents a better spear. It works. It's brilliant. But if he dies before teaching anyone else, the idea dies with him. That's not stupidity. That's just bad math. It's what researchers call cultural drift the gradual loss of knowledge in small, isolated populations. And for most of Homo sapiens' early history, that was the reality. We were rare. Some estimates say the global Homo sapiens population dipped as low as 1,000 to 10,000 individuals during certain bottlenecks. That's fewer than the number of people in a sports arena. Small groups, scattered over massive distances, living on the edge of survival. In those conditions, ideas struggle to spread. Language fragments, stories vanish, tools regress, innovation stalls. But then, something changed. Around 60,000 to 50,000 years ago, populations started to grow. 
the climate stabilized in some regions, coastlines opened migration corridors. Homo sapiens began clustering around rivers, reefs, and resource-rich estuaries. Communities grew, tribes connected, and once enough, people were close enough, long enough, ideas could finally scale. That's when stories survived. That's when skills got taught. That's when culture snowballed. Not because our brains suddenly changed, but because there were finally enough of us to carry the spark forward. This wasn't a revolution of biology. It was a revolution of scale. You've seen it before, the image of evolution as a ladder, a single line, one species stepping over the next, stooped ape to upright caveman to modern human in khakis. Clean, simple, wrong. Human evolution doesn't work like that. It's not a ladder, it's a tree, tangled, twisting, full of forks and failed experiments. A tech tree, not a trophy shelf, with side branches, alternate builds, and strange combinations that sometimes worked and sometimes didn't. In 2013, scientists discovered Homo naledi in South Africa's Rising Star Cave, a species with a brain the size of an orange, but signs of deliberate body placement, maybe even burials. Curved fingers for climbing, but tools for cutting. It was a strange combo, primitive anatomy, advanced behavior, and it lived over 200,000 years ago. Proof that brain size isn't everything, and complexity wasn't exclusive to us. On the island of Flores, scientists found a three-foot-tall species called Homo floresiensis, nicknamed the Hobbit. Tiny bodies, small skulls, but stone tools, fire use, and signs of hunting. They may have lived as recently as 50,000 years ago, coexisting with early Homo sapiens. Another branch, another version of human that walked a different path. For most of our existence, we weren't the only ones. We were part of a tangle, a bush of human cousins, not a solo ascent. And the truth? We didn't win because we were smarter, or better, or chosen. We survived. Sometimes by luck. Sometimes by migration. Sometimes because the others didn't. We carry traces of those other humans in our DNA. Neanderthal, Denisovan, possibly others we haven't even named yet. They live on in our blood. Echoes of minds that once lit fires in caves and carved symbols into shell. We didn't invent humanity, we inherited it. So, what really happened? Around 50,000 years ago, humans start painting on cave walls, making jewelry, crossing seas, telling stories. But by now, we know the truth. That moment wasn't a spark, it was a threshold. For thousands of years, the pieces were already in place. The tools, the symbols, the minds. But scale was missing. Connection was missing. Until, finally, they weren't. When enough humans gathered in the same place for long enough, culture didn't just survive, it exploded. This wasn't a light switch flipping on. It was a fire that had been smoldering for over 100,000 years waiting for the right kindling. Modern behavior wasn't a sudden invention. It was layered. One generation adds ochre. Another figures out glue. Someone drills a bead. Someone else paints a bison on stone. Each act building on what came before, sometimes forgotten, sometimes remembered, but always moving forward. And here's the humbling part. That moment didn't make us special forever. We likely weren't the first to wonder. We may not be the last. The minds that built Brunichel cave rings in darkness. The hands that shaped a Denisovan bracelet. The unknown ancestor that carved zigzags into a shell half a million years ago. They were human too, in ways we're still trying to understand. So maybe the question isn't, when did we become human? Maybe it's, what are we still becoming? because this story didn't end in the Pleistocene. It's still unfolding, in us, around us, because of us. And like the artists who painted in the dark, we're still trying to leave a mark. <laughs>